evening everyone again. So it's uh, Andre here, B6 uh, Bravo Go Faculty, and I'm going to have a presentation today on interference challenges and also some noise issues I had experienced uh, pretty much right after I started uh, my station, started transmitting. So a little bit of an <laughs> overview here. So basically, as I'm going to just show my current general station setup, then we will talk about interference during uh, transmit. And I had some uh, noise mitigation within my household also, just a small example I would like to show you, how the small things can make a big impact on your receipt. So let's just look at the first, uh, first part here, which is our current station setup. So I have five HF antennas and a dummy load. They are all on the roof, even the dummy load is on the roof under the tower, it's like a weatherproof model. I have a, an antenna switch, which is operated via IP and powered through the power over Ethernet. So only two coax cables are coming down from the roof actually for HF. I have one uh, vertical VHF UHF antenna. That's the third coax coming to the shack. The shack is in a basement. So the cables are coming through actually the attic, the main floor, they end up in a basement and then they go horizontally afterwards. Then I have one HF radio and I have one handheld small five watt uh, radio, one amplifier and one manual antenna tuner. It's for HF there. So all coax cables coming down to the basement through an unused gas furnace vent along with the other wires which turn out to be causing some problems, of course. But all those wires coming down from a solar panels, also some CAT6 cables, rotator cable, and some other low voltage, low voltage cables, it's all fitting into this uh, six inch uh, duct, luckily. The station is fed via the 16 m breaker, but it's shared in a room with some other devices, of course. The low voltage devices are fed by a single 35 amp uh, ferrite core transformer. And the amplifier itself has its own circuit, its own uh, 20 amp circuit. So there's just some pictures here. So that's the, the hex beam. It's, this one has actually a couple of elements here. It's three elements to be precise. So one is a 10 to 20 hex portion. The one which is kind of in the middle, it's a diamond shape. It's not really visible there, but this is like a folded uh, terminated dipole. There's like a 50 ohm resistance in the middle. And the very large one is a 40 meter element there. Then it has, a, I have a vertical and I have, this is the VHF UHF and I have a long, 100 feet long uh, wire actually with some uh, some coils uh, in it. So that was actually an alpha delta DX LB plus. So it, it works, let's say properly on 40 meter and uh, on 20, but really the other bands, like the 160 and 80 meter bands are not really good on that actually. So this is just another view from the, the back of the house. And this is actually the chimney where the cables are going into. So it's just a little hole. I left it as a vent still on the top. I didn't cut the top there. And this is just another view from the roof. Uh, so this is actually the antenna switch box there. And this is the, the tower, of course, with the rotator and everything inside there. And the dummy load is just underneath here, actually. All right, this is the station set up uh, in the shack there. You see, that's the big uh, grounding, which is coming just on a grounding rod outside of the window there. There's a desktop I'm using. This is the power supply there. There's the amplifier, the antenna tuner. There's the HF radio. This is the VHF amplifier. This is up to 160 watts. It can capable of on VHF. This I have a little transverter for VHF or HF radio, so I can look at the waterfall. And this is the, the setup on the on the desk now. Now it's the new one. It's the little more ski which I have been doing uh, just about for two weeks now. So that's the part of the training there. And that's the way to the handheld there. So let's see. What happened? So right after I finished installation, which was actually with the hex beam, I did finish it in last summer, but it, even had problems before I put up the big hex beam, even just with a, with a small uh, vertical HF antenna and uh, the long wire, I did experience some issues already. So I grouped up these interferences during transit into two categories. This is a power below 100 watts. And I have another slide on power above 100 watts. So let's say the 
these major ones I could remember still below 100 watts. So the first thing I noticed is that this IP-based IP based antenna switch did uh, disconnect from the radio itself and from a computer a couple of times, which actually um, kept on switching it back to the dummy load, luckily not to the short circuit or anything, but it did cause some problems uh, even at 40 watts sometimes. And uh, then another thing I noticed that some bands were not possible to use depending on the angle of the hex beam on the roof. For example, a 50 meter to Europe was impossible. Like even at uh, just FT8 using 50 watts, 60 watts, it is just uh, interfered with the antenna switch so badly that it just, after about five seconds, the antenna switch disconnected. When it got disconnected, then yeah, there was really no power going to the antenna. Then notice that the internet connection in the house was uh, getting uh, lost uh, once I was transmitting. It, it happened usually after 10 to 15 seconds and typically on 20 and 15 meter bands, even at uh, like it was 80 to 100 watts. So it was pretty much uh, uh, maxing out the power capabilities of the radio. So then it was very typical interference in the house with the sound systems. This I did get complaints from my wife quite often there. It's mostly on 40 meters at 80 watts. That was quite audible on both of the amplifiers. We listen to a lot of radio usually, so uh, it was very easy to, to pick it up, of course, in any of the rooms. Um, I have a little USB tablet of speaker, this Jabra model, which is like an echo cancelling speaker. I could put money on it every time that on 80 meters, whenever I was transmitting, it crashed. So I had to unplug and plug it in. It was mostly annoying when I was doing some FTA during some uh, relatively less entertaining meetings. And then I wanted to use the speaker. I noticed it was dead. So I had to unplug and plug it in again. But um, anyway, that, that was a really funny part of that. Then in my dishwasher had interference. That's 160 meters. That's again, you could just really sit next to it. You transmit 160 meters on a long wire antenna. Definitely, it starts beeping. It actually starts to rise into the cycle. Then I had uh, the USB controller failed. It was pretty typical. This is what Peter mentioned earlier. This is the control board uh, for the Yezu rotator. And then it just uh, started to get false inputs from the antenna, but really not from antenna, from the rotator position itself. It was really just getting inputs like between plus minus 100 degrees. So um, then after transmitting, it's it, it stabilized again. So it's just during transmit was was going a little bit crazy. And the rotator needle was moving during transmitting above 80 watts. That again, we could see that it's plus minus like uh, five, 10 degrees. It was just like slowly up and down, up and down. So let's see what happens when you crank up a big boy here above 100 watts when uh, you really want to do some uh, far away contacts during a contest. And then things happen which really make it more challenging to get the contacts and finish the QSOs. So failing computer keyboard and mouse that was happening around 150 to 250 watts on both 40 and 20 meter bands. That was again very typical. So I could get around it the way that, that uh, I just clicked on transmit or I just pushed the pedal. It was SSB contest. And then uh, I just uh, kept on talking. I got the answer. By the time I got the response back uh, from the other station, then I had to write and everything on a paper and remember the stuff. And then I could type it in. So I, if I was lucky, there was no other issue with the computer after the transit was finished. The antenna switch again, this IP based uh, uh, equipment that was definitely failing way more around 200 to 400 watts. That was really very badly disconnecting. It was like even uh, worse than uh, before. It didn't matter what position the antenna was, it was just really interfering. Computer display shut down. So it was one of the four displays uh, did uh, go off. That was again, it was an error which it was really predictable that on 80 watts, around 300 watts, regardless of which antenna was used for the, for the transmitter, that, that screen just went off, turned off, and then after transit was finished, about 10-15 uh, seconds, it turned back again. Experience some computer shutdowns, luckily not that often, but uh, again, I 
couldn't really figure when it was like really shutting down or you know what what was really the cause of the problem of two to three 200 to 300 watts on 20 meters and about 400 watts on 40 meters that was uh, very typical where a computer either shut down or went to standby mode actually so that was sometimes pretty regular again during contests then i had some problems with some bathroom appliances using touch technology like these electric brushes or some other devices that was also pretty annoying for actually it's all around the house downstairs and upstairs also it's happening and of course i'm not sure what the neighbors experienced because i didn't get any complaints from them luckily so they know it's not 5g related uh, what i'm doing and i guess they would have talked to me if there had been something serious impacted so let's see what happened here so action number one taken first uh, i got these uh, chokes uh, from polymer engineers i actually had chokes on all my lines but i only had these little coax braids put on i had about uh, i think on each line i had at least two on some other lines i had four of them on the antennas right where the connection is and also at the connection of the radio in the shack i had that uh, on the, all the, the coax cables so this is what I installed at the end on all the antennas. So what you see is the top of the hex beam there. There is one for the 10 to 20 meter line. There's one on the 40 meter line on the top. And one is for this uh, folded uh, terminated dipole with the connection here. So each of them got one with a very short uh, wire, it's like a one foot long uh, coax cable. Then of course, the, this is the view then afterwards, the, all the chokes there. The vertical got a choke as well. And also the long uh, wire, and I got the choke as well there. So basically, that was the major step there, of course. So that did help to eliminate, let's say, some of the issues. But disappointingly, still the computer did start to shut down afterwards, still, and then it still did have some interference on the stereo. So it seems that it didn't sort out all the problems. However, it had a bit of an issue with the uh, antenna tuners. It uh, also in the radio has a built-in tuner. I have the manual one. I did notice that they had some impact on the on the SWR reading, and I had to actually set the tuner to different settings after these uh, chokes were installed. Surprisingly, I was, Peter, I was actually consulted about the hex beam <laughs> uh, problems there that it looked like it had some issues once I put on the chokes, but then actually it got sorted out surprisingly on higher power. It had the normal SWR software works for some reasons. So that was action number one, installing the chokes. Action number two, installing chokes on Ethernet cables. Because I was suspecting that uh, there was something probably wrong, wrong with the Ethernet cables again. Some of the cables are coming down on the same chimney as the coax cables. So then I got a big bunch of these uh, large and also the small uh, ferrites or uh, items. And then I did install it uh, on the Ethernet cables at the end, wherever I thought it was necessary. So I also had to get some flat uh, Ethernet cables. These are kept seven, they should be shielded uh, for each pair. So I could twist on a lot of uh, rounds. So this what I installed at the end. Actually, you can see all these chokes here on the back side of the computer. There are Ethernet cables, mostly USB cables, keyboard and mouse cables. They all got the is it the chokes there? Also the back side of the radio. Actually, I could all, I only install the back side of the radio first. It's just the, the for the Ethernet connection. And I think that was. I see that was going for the, the transverter there. So I just was just doing some trial and error. And of course, I also installed on a power cable on the low voltage feed line and going to the radio. I installed also this choke. Then I also put up uh, as a main switch in a house that's feeding uh, uh, some uh, power over Ethernet appliances. So this is the cable actually going up to the roof. So that got a choke as well, of course, on this end also. And this is a switch in the shack, which is feeding uh, the printer and some other computers and the radio itself. So this also got a choke on the radio and then on the, on the, on the radio controller uh, computer. Right, and also the main feed uh, into the shack has also got a big choke. 
And then this is the, the branch coming down from the roof. This is all the lightning protection. One branch is for the antenna switch. Oh, it's not really like missing from the picture, but this one got a choke there also on this end as well. And then this is the rotator controller cable that got the choke inside. And this was the, these were the all the right beads put on the cable. So I left on a few of them still on this side, but it didn't really help a lot. And unfortunately, the cable was sometimes too short. Some cables were too short to install some more of these. All right, unfortunately. And this is up on a roof. This is the antenna switch assembly. So itself is a, is a large unit. And this was, now I know that it was not in a metal box, but it should have been probably. So actually I got this uh, copper tape and I put uh, this tape uh, around there, actually on the box wherever I could. And then uh, I did put also this uh, extra shielding. This is like the, the separator for the power over a tenant, which one branch goes to 12 volt plug, other branch one goes to the, the network cable. So you got an extra shielding there. And you can see also it got the, the wire itself got another uh, choke there as well. So that's basically, and one more action. Yes, this is a recent one. I did get uh, a cheap uh, UPS uh, from Kijiji. The battery is still good. So let's say it can run a computer for about like 30 to 40 minutes itself. But basically, I think it was mentioned on a, one of the software meetings. It has a really good uh, noise filtering and also you know, it gives some backup. It's hoping that the noise filtering works both ways. It seems to be working that way also. So it, it sort out some of the, well, if it sort out, I would say most of the problems afterwards. So let's see what happened after this, uh, taking this action. So basically, no more interference on the home network during transmit. That is really good. So everyone can keep up the Wi-Fi connection or the hardwired connection in the house. That's great news. The rotator and its controller does not indicate false directions anymore. So it's all very stable. It's, it's still changing a few degrees occasionally, but uh, it doesn't shut down. It doesn't do anything weird on it anymore. So I'd say get excellent news there. No more, no more your computer shut down due to interference. Well, the computer doesn't go to standby mode either. That's excellent again. And uh, also as a significant to reduce noise on the on the sound amplifiers in the house also all around. So that's uh, that's really another great news uh, for the people not having uh, fun with the, the radio in the house whenever I'm transmitting. And definitely the major result is that there's more confidence in operating the station. So knowing that the system is more reliable, so you don't expect any sudden shutdown or, or bad surprises. So that, that does help a, a lot there. And uh, there's unfortunately one thing still is the dishwasher has not uh, got any impact of all these actions. So basically the plan is now that uh, the, I just flip off the, baker, the breaker of the dishwasher whenever I'm doing high power transmitting and uh, just leave the door open so it doesn't start the program itself. And the, the remediation could be that I will install some ferrite rings on the on a feed line of it, but can it, unfortunately it's a relatively short cable so I could just remove it from the wall and then I, I cannot make a lot of turns on the, on the ferrite core. But apart from this, I think it has been all pretty well resolved at the moment. So I have used now power up to about uh, 600 watts on 20 meters and 40 meters. And then I did not uh, notice any impact what I used to have. So happy days there, of course. Another topic which I wanted to also mention here. Oh, wait a moment. Uh, OK, sorry, I have a summary here. That's an important one, sorry, it's a conclusion, which uh, what I would do differently if I could rebuild my wall system. So first of all, what I could do is uh, use better quality shielded uh, cables. So it's like the shielded CAT6 cable or better. I think that definitely would have helped because there are a lot of cables going up the roof or some of them, or some cameras and Wi-Fi access points and so on. So then they should have been a better quality, but I built those ones even before I was thinking about uh, putting out some big antennas on the roof. Good quality wires to the stereo. So 
again on the input side where you get your little uh, phone or you have your Bluetooth hub or you have your, your external device which goes into the amplifier, those cables should be a good quality also. And you know, buy the ones which probably have some uh, ferrite cores as well, ferrite beams, because that's, uh, that would help to eliminate some of the noise there. Next uh, lesson is that leave extra length on both ends of the cables, of course. So it uh, would give you enough uh, slack, slack to install some ferrite cores, or if you need to splice the cable later on, if you need to replace the plug. So again, I didn't have a lot of extra wire on most of the cables, unfortunately. So that was uh, some challenge. Don't save on chokes. Uh, you know, the bits, bits may, may not be sufficient. So if you're buying uh, an expensive antenna, just please uh, spend another 50 bucks or 100 bucks on getting a proper choke there. So then uh, you eliminate most of these challenges I had there for a while. Then run wires on the shortest possible route to the shacks or the shack uh, and try not to couple all the wires uh, next to each other. Again, I would have uh, talked now that it would have been better to, to bring the cables down from the roof outside of the house potentially and just bring them into the shack on the other side. Don't use the old chimney, which used to be in the middle of the house, of course, with all other wires around. Have a separate breaker for the radio itself. Of course, it's, uh, it's quite important there. I think now learning that also. And uh, of course, a proper acute antenna should cause less RFI. Uh, trouble, particularly on higher power. I think that's it's also a lesson I learned here. So, so just possible make your antenna resonant and then you don't get a lot of uh, RF feedback from it. All right, so this, this is the lessons learned from this uh, uh, interference uh, topic. And I want to talk about another topic here, which is some noise mitigation in a house. So that was again a relatively annoying uh, a challenge I experienced or a challenge I went through. And uh, so this is related to this fairy lights. I don't know if you're probably familiar with it. This is used for Christmas decoration. We have some, we have lots of shops in the front of the house and a lot in the back also. We like to have these fairy lights on. They are programmed, they come on usually about half an hour after um, sunset and they go off like half an hour before sunrise. And then at night they are off for a few hours, like between midnight and four o'clock they are off. So it's more like for giving some some light in the back alley there where it's, there's no lights from the city. So people actually like the neighbors had a positive comment about this. They want to have this on because it gives them some more safety. So I said, yes, okay, why not? So I experienced some issues with it and it took me a lot of time to figure out what was causing it. So basically when these lights were on, uh, getting about 1s unit noise on 40 meters and on 80 meters and 160 meters, so it's getting about 3s units of noise. That's a lot. So basically, the this uh, entire setup is consisting of about 1,000 feet of ferry lights. These are typically coming in a 50 feet uh, segment, so we have lots of those ones, of course. And they actually work like a large antenna all around the house here, of course. And it used to be fed by a 8 and 12 watt uh, cheap switching power supply adapter. So then uh, before I actually replaced uh, this adapter, you could see on the top part here, this is 80 meters. And uh, what you see here was actually using the vertical antenna. You could see this is when uh, this was switched off. So it was a noise before and noise after. It's turned off. It's still a lot of noise though, but it was significantly more before. This is showing 40 meters. It's not very visible here. You need to look at also this segment, which is a six second, six second. There is some change there, but when you are actually listening to SSB, you could you could notice it. There is some some noise in the background. So that's how it how it was before. And then um, what happened as a, as a replacement here? This is how it used to be. Again, it got uh, some uh, ferrite chokes on both ends. They did not help at all. At, when I put them on, there was absolutely no change in the noise. And went back for a traditional transformer, of course, with uh, just a ferrite core transformer and then uh, with some diode. So that's enough for the ferry light. So they don't need a very well stabilized power. So they stabilize themselves. 
So that worked pretty well. So it's way quieter indeed. So what we see here is that where a line is actually, this is when a switch was happening. So again, back to 80 meters. That was, I'm not sure if it was turned on or, on or off. It doesn't matter. This was the switches here. So there was, again, no change in the noise. And, and 40 meters is the same. There was no change in the noise there. So it's just a line when it turns on or off uh, there. So it did the work at the end, luckily. I was really happy with that. So you need to turn these lights off when I was actually doing some uh, listening even in the evenings. So some further actions we took. So it tried to eliminate all the switching power supplies in the household. So remove these cheap phone chargers. So we have now just a central charging location in the living room here. So this is where we charge all the, the phones and iPads and what have you. And we don't leave this, this charger plugged into the wall anymore. So we don't have the, the chargers in every room anymore with the, the wire plugged in also, of course, which is acting as an antenna. So it's one. One charger or two chargers, higher power, so you can charge more devices, but they, they are better quality. And uh, the next uh, item I would suggest also that it's always check on the, on the waterfall if the new device is causing any noise. So you can take corrective action, so it's necessary or return the product, of course. Might be some interference uh, grounds, you could uh, probably get some of your money back. Then, uh, of course, the chokes on a coax cables also have to reduce some of the noise. So that's, again, related to transmit and also on the receive side. We experience some of the noise going down because of those. And at the end, unfortunately, some noise cannot be cut, of course. But therefore, you know, you have some smart tools to reduce them. Some of the radios, of course, you have uh, some noise filtering. So you need to play with quite a bit so you could eliminate this undesired noise. And of course, some noise might also be intentional as well, which I picked this up on uh, 80 meters with uh, it's FT8 uh, band there, where some people are having, of course, a lot of fun. So that's not was not really impacting the, the transmit there, but of course, uh, as we experienced also during contests, some people are having fun just putting in some extra noise and making a QSO a little bit more complicated. Uh, of course, by tuning up amplifier for two minutes or uh, something similar, and then uh, you just you just can't hear anymore, and then you just tune away, of course, from that frequency. So basically, that's all I wanted to say today. I hope uh, that's been pretty informative. So uh, if you like to ask, just uh, please go ahead. And because uh, I actually I need to leave in the next few minutes. I have a CW training starting at eight o'clock. So if you could ask uh, now, please go ahead. If you prefer to ask on Sastar or by email privately also, I'm also welcoming those. I'll, I'll just step in here, um, Andre. Thank you very much for, for your presentation and all the work put together to summarize everything and, and, and uh, show us the process that you went through to, to get through here. I realize you've got, uh, you got to get going here quickly, but what I'd like to do uh, with the rest of the time tonight is to talk more about uh, this issue of RFI. Unfortunately, uh, you won't be able to be with <laughs> us tonight, but next time we can ask you more questions on that, but we can continue on. There's quite a few uh, uh, people on here tonight uh, that, that have experience with these issues that can contribute. And um, uh, so uh, again, thank you so much for that. Uh, I, I do, did have one question for you uh, before you go real briefly. Have you noticed um, any RFI coming from any of the neighbors or the neighborhood? Like I used to have a, um, a, a neighbor behind me. They've moved since uh, I had this problem, but I could tell as soon as they switched off something on the waterfall, everything cleared up. Have you noticed anything like that as well? Yes, I did notice actually it's an ongoing problem still. I think one of the neighbors have a blender or some other device, which they usually use for the exactly program. I think it's either 30 seconds or one minute. It's on. It just makes a huge noise. And I, I had this problem every time I'm doing contest. It's usually happening in the morning. It's between seven and nine o'clock. And that is is again, they use it usually going maybe maximum like three cycles. And I have it and I couldn't manage to track this down which neighbor is uh, 
explain it. But apart from that, uh, luckily in a the neighborhood, there is no uh, people like me putting out some Christmas lights uh, with uh, this cheap uh, switching power supply. So then I did not notice anything else. So. Great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, could be a power shake for the day or something like that. <laughs> coffee grinder is, uh, as George is suggesting. Uh, one That's last been... question. One last question. And that is how, how are you enjoying the CW Academy and how's that coming? I think it's a fantastic course. So it's a lot of homework. It is a lot of hard work. Uh, what I experienced now is that I have been listening quite a lot. Uh, I, you need to do at least uh, 45 minutes uh, listening and 50 minutes uh, transmitting. Once you listen, a transmit is actually the easy part. That's like using this double pedal for transmitting. That's actually the fun part of it. And then listening part, this is when you, you learn a lot. And we have a great instructor as well. And uh, he's very, very patient. So basically, it's most of the time he's throwing at uh, you know, some, something to decode for us. This is actually most of the class. Then we actually transmit to each other and we try to figure out what we what we did it's uh, very entertaining but uh, after uh, the class which is usually about hour hour and 50 minutes it's just like very tired in the head i would say so <laughs> very tired but i think cw i kind of figured that i didn't start it earlier but i think if you do amateur radio sooner or later i think once you get into it is it's really amazing i think it's really with a small power you do transmit very far and learning it is like learning an instrument you really learn the tones so it's just you know kind of a, an exercise for the brain also if you if you are new to it i'm pretty sure you you jerry or peter you know you are very much used to it now for you it's probably just coming like this there's no 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 much of a brain power needed anymore but uh, for newbies like myself it's a lot of thinking it's and it's kind of a good way of thinking you you train your brain for that Great. Uh, so I'm having fun. I could uh, recommend it to everyone to, to do that, of course. Strongly recommending that. Great. What question, Andre? Go ahead, Peter. Um, those chokes that you used, Andre, were they red core or were they ferrites? Red core is an iron core. Uh, okay. That was sold as uh, these ones, right? Uh, they were sold as... Uh, chokes actually they were sold as on them something for doing uh uh balloon sizing that kind of chokes they saw it for that it's actually some rated for two kilowatt but i don't yeah. exactly know the material of that yeah okay i will let you go and um i'll throw up a screen and recommend they should really be type 31 so uh there may be some f some further performance there andre enjoy your academy and uh we'll catch you later Thanks very much, everyone. Take care, Dan, and we catch up uh, shortly, Dan. Thank right. you again, Andre, and good luck with your CW. And uh, um, we'll uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks or maybe sooner. Yeah, that's right. All right, take care, Dan. Bye bye. Yeah, my quick my comment was there for um, inter for uh, if you're making balance, it's a very very different thing than trying to. Uh, Time to try to suppress uh, interference like Andre was with dishwasher and things. So the type 31 mix is recommended for under 300 megahertz uh, um, and uh, 42, 42 mix you can see from 25 to 30. So, um, you know, do get the right cores uh, if you're trying to do that. And one last comment, uh, he said that he reduced his uh, receive noise by putting chokes on the feed line. And those chokes should be like bare ballon chokes. So they should be, uh, uh, they should probably be a nickel zinc material, probably like uh, 43 material. So anyway, any questions on that stuff? Uh, don't, uh, don't, don't hesitate to fire them my way. Okay, very good. Well, yeah, it's a, uh... It's a bit of a art as well as a science to, um, to troubleshoot all these uh, stray signals. We've got them coming from our own uh, devices as well as from perhaps neighbors or other sources. I had a few years ago a, a, a transformer, which was uh, literally about half a mile from my house. 
and I went out with the uh, NMAX guy and we tracked it down. He had all the, the uh, equipment. And in those days, I was allowed to go in the truck with him. Uh, soon after that, they came up with a policy, no more. But uh, we tracked it down and there had been a, a bird's nest on a, on a pole and they had built a, a fancy, uh, fancy nest that was shorting out or causing all kinds of buzzing in one of these transformers. And uh, he had a parabolic dish, which he could listen to it. And, uh, and so we replaced that, that helped tremendously. Uh, um, but I was amazed at how far away it was from my house and how much it was radiating. So these things can go a long way. There's a, there's a very good book uh, the ARL puts out on RFI uh, uh, canceling. And so uh, it's a little out of date now, but really not too bad. Um, there's a lot of things that, that can, can affect this. In fact, I don't know if they still do, but Kara used to have um, an official position for RFI troubleshooter and Bear EV6TN used to be, I think he was the last designated one I, I know of, but I don't know if he's still in that role or whatever. Maybe uh, Dana, you might know something on uh, if there's if there's still a, a person that's designated in CARA for that. I don't know about designated or not. Um, I do know I actually have a number of ferrites and whatnot here um, uh, donated by Ray Bourne um, for, for that purpose uh, that, that might be useful, uh, available to somebody if they're trying to troubleshoot this kind of problem. Um, so he donated that on his way out of town. He's moved out to the island. Okay. Um, and these, these uh, ferrite beads or chokes, they're not cheap. Uh, have you got a kind of a feel for how, how many you get in, uh, in a box uh, from Palomar or whatever. It's been a long time since I've ordered a, a bunch. Yeah, they, they can be, uh, you know, the bigger ones for balance can be uh, four or five, six bucks a piece. Um, and the beads, uh, you know, the beads can be pretty pricey too, but do check out, uh, do check out, I don't know if the shop has any, uh, do check out DX Engineering as well. Uh, check out Fairright, check out Polymar Engineers, and um, Ham Kits and Parts. All those guys have uh, Fairright chokes and beads, so compare them. Um, one other thing that I did think I did put on the reflector is uh, an amazing thing for us Canucks, is that DX Engineering actually ships out of Ontario. So if you want pieces, um, they don't, uh, they FedEx to you from Ontario, and what you see when you pay on the website is exactly, you don't get surprised by uh, the courier grab in the end. So uh, don't be afraid to order stuff that way. You know what it's gonna cost you. Um, uh, ferrites un are unknown. Uh, you know, there's a problem, Dana, is when you don't know what they are, there is a way of finding out what they are. You can measure inductance in that and get an idea, but it's really tough to know what ferrites you have. Um, one last comment on this, Jerry, uh, I, uh, and uh, I think uh, 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 Amir knew that we were fooling around with um, these noise cancelers. So if you're interested in that issue, um, uh, uh, is it, it's John, Echo Yankee. Uh, he borrowed, uh, yeah, it's Ken, right? Ken, we, uh, he has your, um, your uh, MFJ, and he has my NCC noise canceller, and he's done a fair bit of this. So he's got a Yagi or an antenna that he, uh, he uses with, a, with a, um, a tiny SA spectrum analyzer to walk around the neighborhood and find these horrible switch mode power supplies that are causing problems. And, and then the end, if you can't get a hold of the neighbor that's causing the interference, then maybe all you can do is install one of these noise canceller things. So uh, I did post on the website about RFI and uh, V6EY's uh, post there. So as you start to learn this stuff, get back on the reflector and fire one of us a comment. And uh, yeah, and uh, I know uh, Jerry uh, QLT is another guy that's had experience with chasing this kind of crap down. So, uh, and also um, Doug, uh, Dougie, uh, of course, uh, Doug Howard has a, an army of equipment there and uh, he has professional equipment. So if you really get hammered, I'm sure that a kind word to him will, you'll get some help there. Uh, go ahead, Jerry. Okay, yeah, very good. I remember when John, uh, John Fallows is what uh, who Peter was talking about. Um, 
he borrowed my MFJ 1026 noise canceller and he compared it with the uh, time wave uh, ANC4 and found that the, uh, the MFJ doesn't quite work. Uh, it doesn't get you full 180 degree phase uh, cancellation, which is what I had experienced. And uh, Rich V6AX had the same problem with his uh, MFJ. And so uh, we found that at least a couple of them didn't work as, uh, as was uh, supposed or as they were supposed to. That's a little bit different situation. That's noise that's coming in from a neighbor or from a, a little bit of a distance uh, because what you can do is uh, change the, you have to have two antennas, uh, your regular uh, receive antenna and a noise receive antenna. And then you can try to rotate the phase relative to each other to cancel out the noise that's coming in at a different angle than the signals that would be coming in. So that's the idea between behind those noise cancelers. But Peter's right, if, if you can't solve uh, these problems directly by going to a neighbor or finding a, a, a problem uh, electrical pole, then uh, you may have to resort to one of those. Uh, but the uh, the time wave worked much better. And what John Fallows is doing is he's actually got a, uh, a dual uh, SDR receiver, which he can then phase uh, together and, and create uh, something similar to what the hardware was doing. So uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things uh, we have to combat these days. It used to be a lot simpler. We'd have a low pass filter on the end of our um, uh, transmission line. So we wouldn't be, uh, uh, you know, when we were on 10 meters, we weren't bothering our neighbor's TV sets uh, on uh, a channel two, which was 54 megahertz, and we were on 27 or 28, uh, hopefully, not CB. But uh, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot to this topic, and you can become a, a specialist in it for sure. Um, what I was curious, and I'll have to maybe ask Andre separately is where his dishwasher is in relation to where the, the cables are and going through. And another question is um, whether or not, I think someone else wanted to know this as well, um, where, um, let's see, um, were his antennas resonant or was he creating too much of a, uh, uh, reflected wave by by not having enough uh, of a tuned antenna situation. I know if I'm on uh, 80 or 160 meters, I'm, I've got a lot more RF coming back into the shack because I have a hard time getting my, my uh, shunt fed tower tuned up on those bands and I've got uh, SWR well above two or in, in some cases uh, above three to one. So I... Um. I Jerry, a comment on that. Um, uh, if you had to look at the pictures of Andre's shack and setup, he has a very large uh, loop antenna. His 40 meter hex beam is about 40 feet in diameter. It's right in the center of his roof. So he gets a large magnetic field component uh, induced into everything and all his wiring in the house and everything. So um, that's one of the worst case situations and his verticals and all that are very close in proximity to the house. So, um, and if you look what he did right, he's got a good grounding panel. Uh, he's got good tidy entry. He's got good tidy of all his, uh, all his electrical stuff. So he's done everything right in setting up the station, maybe separating stuff like Pat uh, questioned if you put your IP stuff in a separate uh, a metallic conduit, yes, that would also be a good idea and separate stuff out. It's always a good idea to do that, but uh, you know, his is a his a tough situation, Jerry. Okay, well, um, that's kind of my comments and I'd like to open it up to uh, other questions, uh, experiences, com comments or questions and uh, it can be on this topic or we can move off if there's uh, uh, not um, not any more questions on this topic. We can we can move off to other topics of, of interest. I have one question. Go ahead. It's um, when I saw uh, the the ground bus that Andre had put in. I was wondering, um, did he did he also bond to his uh, house ground? He I think he mentioned when he was speaking that he was just connected to a, 
a ground rod outside. And I wonder because ever since, uh, uh, I can't remember, uh, two or three presentations ago when we talked about grounding, I've been sort of, you know, worrying about whether I should uh, connect your, or bond my uh, radio ground to my home ground. And especially with, with Andre running the levels of power that he is, I wonder if that uh, is a concern. I don't know if it would go to noise uh, as much as safety. Peter, you want to take this one? Yeah, I'm just going to post that it should be uh, should be bonded, Jeff. Um, uh, it's going to be connected anyway, um, but definitely uh, your um, you should have a connection. I think between your you're you're going to have it connected anyway because you're going to connect your radio and all the cases and everything in that are going to be connected to the panel as it comes in the house, right? And so you don't have to, uh, I think that was where the confusion with, uh, with Jerry's question. You don't have to open up an electrical box somewhere. You don't have to um, you know, physically make a wire over to that. I think you have bonding through all your coax cables and everything else. But if you do happen to have an electrical panel at the shack, and I, I was fortunate enough to have that on a wall only about uh, uh, you know, two or three meters from the, uh, from the antenna entry, definitely run a number six uh, ground wire uh, from your electrical panel to your, your outside electrical ground and also to your antenna ground and tie all that stuff together as short as possible. Uh, uh, you, you, you just can't beat it for, uh, you know, for, for RF grounding and lightning protection, Jeff. Okay, thank you. That's, that's good to know. So you do, I guess, erase some of the, um, uh, the, the power differential simply by virtue of the, uh, uh, the ground that goes through your, your outlet. Yeah, and and um, there is uh, there's always concern of lightning strikes and what it hits. And uh, um, it, there's a Tom Rush W uh, W eight J I uh, uh, has uh, some good diagrams of where you can connect stuff. And if your electrical panel's a long way from your shack, well, then there's a kind of a question, you know, am I really going to go around outside, uh, you know, with a, with a 20 meter long wire to connect them together? I wouldn't do that necessarily. Um, the whole idea is if lightning hits something, you want your shack and, uh, you know, all your power and all the stuff to kind of raise and voltage together and not have anything that's not, uh, you know, not connected so that you get a differential between pieces of equipment and then get an arc or something between them. And that's the concept, Jeff. Got it. Thank you. There's a question from Brent about, uh, is this a uh only a concern on HF or do we have something uh, similar to worry about with VHF, UHF? Does anyone want to address that one? I would say that you certainly can. Uh, at my home here, I have an ear mod problem with Albert Health Services paging system and uh, broadcast FM radio stations. And, uh, and so uh, a two meter bandpass filter in line helps with that one. But even with that in line, I've still got S4 to S7 noise on two meters most of the time at my location. Um, I don't know about transmitting causing problems with anything, but uh, certainly it's a problem to receive. Okay, yeah, um, I, you make a good point and that is there's no, there's no frequency that is immune from RF noise getting into it. It's uh, whether or not you're going to be interfering with somebody else or some other piece of equipment. And so those are the two sides of this, uh, this noise problem. Yeah, and on that side, I mean, I have seen uh, your UHF, VHF will get into stereo amplifiers and whatnot uh, if, if you're too close to, to those. And so being in an apartment building like I am, uh, that the neighbor stereos are not that far away. Um, so I'm probably smarter off doing digital modes and things that they can't recognize a voice out of. Very good. Pat had a, a good point and about the internet service provider. And uh, you want to elaborate a little bit, Pat? Sorry, I wasn't ready for the question. Um, yeah, I recall, uh, I think it was Vince maybe that was saying that uh, if you're running uh, coax in your house for your uh, uh, Shaw connection, that it was actually running at, I think he said 20 meters and that 
it would be heavily influenced by interference from transmitting. And so replacing that with digital cables uh, changed that. So interesting that Andre was saying that his, uh, his internet was affected. And, and I was thinking, what is his uh, provider? I don't know the infrastructure there. Interesting. I had uh, about a year ago, uh, maybe a little longer than that, maybe it was two years ago already, I had some problems with my uh, TELUS internet. And, uh, and so it was supposed to be 60 megabyte. And so, uh, but it was only about 20 something. And so one of the, it turned out that one of the channels, it was uh, twin uh, connections. Uh, one of the connections was not working properly. And so the, the technician came out to the house and he's diagnosing things. And the first thing he, he said to me, he says, oh, you're a ham operator. Uh, we, we actually have a classification uh, in our checklist uh, for ham operators. And uh, he, he brought out his iPad and he said, okay, and here's the, the, the he had a whole list of things to check off as uh, potential issues. And I said, well, now that you mentioned that, I'd like to uh, uh, transmit while you're here. He had his noise sniffer. And so we went, uh, he was in the uh, upstairs uh, where I am right now is where my, uh, my uh, TELUS equipment comes in. And so I went down the basement and I started transmitting and uh, I said, I'm gonna go on a number of different bands and antennas. And so over the next five minutes, I want you to, uh, record and he recorded everything and he said you know I, d I am not seeing anything to be worried about and he showed me the he captured the screens and he had it all he said yeah I can see a little bit of uh, noise here and there when you were on different bands and whatever but it was well below what we would expect to have a problem with it turned out that the problem was with their switch in the neighborhood and they had to put some new hardware into that switch and then I haven't had a problem since then but uh, yeah, they, they're aware of us. Okay, um, we don't have fiber here yet. So that's uh, another, another issue. Well, uh, they tell us, we'll sell it to you whether they have it or not, you know. Yes, that's true. Yeah, I was scrupulously careful not to sign up for the faster speed internet until they not only had the fiber in the neighborhood, but connected right inside my house. Because, you know, uh, before that, uh, you're paying for nothing. I have Wi-Fi. Shouldn't it be interference free? Okay. Uh, any more questions about uh, interference one way or another? Maybe not a question, but just a comment. I'm not sure it came up, but one of the first things I think that you always need to start off with is just um, shut off the master breaker. Especially if you can just run your rig off D a DC like a battery for a second. And, and that pretty much tells you right away if the problem's coming from within your house or without. Or if you can't do that to shut off individual breakers and then uh, see and be monitoring the noise on your radios to see if there's a particular circuit that's giving you a problem, then you can track that down. Yeah, well, that's kind of the next step. I just sort of thought, well, before I go one breaker at a time, why don't I just turn the radio on, listen to this annoying Calgary S6 hiss and just shut the whole bloody system down. And my radio runs pure DC off a, off a battery anyway. And it didn't make a difference, so okay. Yeah, um, years ago when I was trying to uh, pin down this problem with uh, uh, 80 and 160 meters, this uh, noise, I've, it was 20 over nine on all, uh, all through 80 and, and 160 at night, uh, um, especially, well, that's the time you listen. So uh, I, uh, I drove around the neighborhood with, um, my car radio on AM uh, broadcast band at around 1700 or whatever, there wasn't a station. And uh, we have buried power lines here in my neighborhood, but there's a, these green transformers every uh, 10 houses or something like that. And every time I went by one of those, the hum would go way up. And, uh, and so the whole neighborhood is just buzzing. And then I went by a superstore and uh, it, and, and traffic lights and wherever you went, it was just everywhere. So I kind of threw up my hands and uh, figured that I just have to live with it. 
uh, it's gotten better over the years for, I, I don't know why, but uh, uh, also I think a lot of it, I can filter out with my radio. I have a very good uh, uh, high-end radio that, that helps a lot uh, with digital filtering and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, it's uh, still on 160, uh, very, very hard to, uh, to operate there because of my at least S7 to S9 noise and so uh, uh, sometimes FT8 can get through or CW can get through that because you have a very narrow signal and you're filtering out a lot of the, the noise. If you put it on AM setting for the radio, you just it blasts you away uh, with uh, six kilohertz of bandwidth or whatever. So uh, it's, it's being in the city uh, is, has got its problems, especially on, on the longer wavelengths. Um, another comment, Jerry, I, I mentioned that I had a neighbor, uh, I had a really severe one just recently, and it was minus, well, minus 60, which is what, an S, S7 or something like that. And, uh, and if you look at the waterfall displays, you'll see those tracks that Andre showed. And so the switch mode power supplies are every 100 kilohertz, every 160 kilohertz or so on the band. So that's a distinct signature. Um, I drove, I walked around with my Grundig on one of those frequencies I was able to find out and then, uh, and it, and then it, it would only go, it would actually stop at one time a day and I kind of, well, it's probably a grow light and, um, and then I watched that pattern for several weeks and then one day it just seemed to disappear and it disappeared for a half a day or a day and then it came back on again and then um, there's a neighbor just uh, who I have good, good relations with uh, just across the alley and uh, we were talking, mentioning, I said, well, I see you have some grow lights. She was, had some bedding out plants that she had there. And she says, yeah, I had this horrible set that I got from, I don't know where, Costco or something, she says, and the thing was acting up and everything else. And I said, well, it was making a terrible radio noise all over the spectrum. And I says, I was worried it might cause a fire or something. She said, boy, am I glad I took that back. So I, I, think, I think we solved our problem there. And um, you people who don't do uh, H or don't do HF, um, it can nail you on VHF if you have really bad stuff. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, if you open your squelch, uh, even on FM, uh, I have heard it. It's it's possible to nail VHF. So you're not free from RFI up there, but it's not as likely. So. You've seen a couple of car adapters. A couple of individuals will have a plug into the 12 volt plug in your car to give you your five volt USB power. And we've seen seen a couple of those where the noise from those was enough to completely desense a two meter radio receive. Yeah, that's that's unbelievable, Dana. And um, uh, one of you guys might have been around when Doug and I were having a discussion about car alarms. And uh, this is maybe off topic, but might be interesting. Um, about them capturing uh, and spoofing car alarms. So if you have these keyless alarms, um, that one of the tricks that they use for that is a repeater. Um, so that when your fob is continuously setting out these little pulses searching for the vehicle. So they will put a, a repeater near your front door wherever you keep your keys and another guy will have a box at the car and it will send a signal back and uh, allow them to gain entry to the vehicle. It doesn't get to let them start it, but they may come back later if they can make a key and then they can come back later and then drive it away. Um, so, but the interesting thing I found is twice at Superstore, I have not been able to open my car. Um, I've got an old Acura with a really old, old key, you know, and so it's interference on 432. And I wondered, is that, it's right near Jerry's house. Um, and I wondered, is that normal interference or is it, somebody that is actually jamming that because I've heard of that as another issue. So if you do experience that, let us let the ham community know because that is one trick they use. So they put a jammer around 433 megahertz, then people who walk away from their cars do not lock them. And they can't, they'll lock. If they don't turn back and see the, you know, that the thing is actually locked and the vehicle is not locked. And so they can come back and rifle through the car. So that's another trick that's being used. So it's another form of RFI. It's uh, uh, not very nice. What do they use for those? Um, they'll do the loop to loop so you don't steal the shopping carts. Um, uh, what would you do it? Anyone know what kind of frequencies those are running at? Yeah, that's 
fairly low frequency. I think those are just down on the hundreds of kilohertz. I think Dana, yeah, with the locking wheels on them, that's pretty bizarre, isn't it? That's funny stuff. That would be one heck of an interesting R5. You live beside a supermarket if you could set those off. <laughs> yeah, my son was into doing that I kind like of stuff. My son was into doing that stuff as a as a teenager, kind of spoofing some of the stuff and having great fun with it. You know, you never, fortunately, he never ended up on the wrong side of it. We were talking earlier with Matt about Arduino before the, the, the session today. And uh, one of the first examples I saw when I was starting to research that was uh, this guy had used, uh, uh, built with his Arduino kit, a way of <clears throat> finding out how to get into hotel rooms with those uh, magnetic key things. And uh, he was able to get through thousands of uh, rooms with his uh, little device, which he was, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of, but uh, uh, quickly the the tutorial that he had posted on YouTube got taken down. Yeah, I would think you could walk into some embarrassing situations. Um, I was going to ask, uh, Dana, you were mentioning that uh, the um, little plug-in chargers for USB in the car were causing a lot of RFI. What about the built-in ones that vehicles often come with now? Uh, I don't know in general. Uh, I haven't encountered that as a problem uh, yet. The um, see what might be um, people with golden triangle um, might be an interesting one. There's a, there's a handful of hams to support that one, and they tend to rent new vehicles, right? So they'll, they'll do vehicle rentals with temporary radio installs on those. And so I sort of expect to hear it from uh, from that group first. Um, yeah, as far as if new ones have. But yeah, I haven't encountered that, but I have seen the case of the, the external plug-in ones. Um, the ones where you take them apart, you're kind of scared about how much power you're putting through it because uh, there isn't very much wire in them. Yeah, yeah the ones right. that are uh, built into a car, uh, they've been filtered fairly heavily. And uh, Pat may be aware of it also, but uh, it's uh, a big issue in aircraft because a lot of people are using uh, tablets and GPS and uh, kind of uh, portable equipment plugged into the aircraft electrical system and it'll wipe out uh, your reception totally. So there are ones that are actually uh, uh, FCC uh, compliant in that to use in aircraft and that uh, so that it doesn't uh, wipe out reception and that. So it's uh, it's down to looking for the the better ones, and uh, there is a classification for ones that do meet the uh, FCC uh, compliancy in that. I was reading recently about uh, car chargers uh, for electric cars that uh, there's a company that's uh, or several companies trying to uh, develop inductive chargers where they put the the big uh, magnetic field in in the floor of your garage. And uh, we're talking like 20 kilowatts of power or something like that. And the harmonics and everything that's coming out of these things uh, is so, so bad that uh, it doesn't look like they'll ever pass any kind of uh, uh, FCC regulations. It's just uh, not gonna happen. I did cause one in the mobile actually. When I first did the install, I had a problem I didn't realize up front. And uh, there, there was enough reflected RF energy coming back. It would turn the seat warmer on. Um, and uh, I think that was the only thing it ever actually did in the car. I started worrying if it might set off an airbag or something, because that would be pretty catastrophic. Um, and uh, what it ended up being, because I haven't seen it since, was uh, I'd, I'd built a mount for the quarter panel out front. And the antenna I was using wasn't deep enough for the NMO mount. The center conductor in there was not contacting. And I didn't realize it was working because the repeaters I was using in town had they worked just fine without the antenna even connected properly until I get out in the Kananaskis and then uh, start troubleshooting it more. But uh, yeah, that was one where, where some weird behavior occurred and it was because I had uh, not improper antenna connection. I had an antenna like that and I and, uh, ended up putting a penny between the uh, contacts to uh, until I ended up fixing it and uh, getting the proper antenna, but that was probably in there for six months, but uh, it's just the right size to put a, a penny in to make contact between the two, uh, the two pins and that. Yeah, I didn't realize it at the time until I put an antenna analyzer on it and something is wrong here. <laughs> and it took a while to figure out, but uh, yeah, I just had another antenna that was shorter and screw in connection, it worked fine. 
you put uh, pennies in the fuse box too there, Jerry? Oh, uh, yeah. Like I say, when they did away with pennies and that, my toolbox became a lot lighter. Yeah, a penny for your uh, QSO, right? I had a similar problem there, Dana, because I, I could hit repeaters very easily without hardly anything attached to the antenna. And uh, it, it took me a while. And then finally, I realized that what's supposed to be a 65 watt uh, output, I was only getting 40 watts when I finally fixed the antenna. So it, it did some permanent damage to the finals in there, but I'm still using the radio. I, uh, I don't know how long I went with this thing like that until I was actually out of Calgary and trying to hit, hit uh, uh, other people or repeaters that I, uh, this, this just isn't working well enough, <laughs> so yeah. Okay, uh, anyone else questions or comments? Actually, uh, just before we wrap up, I just noticed that Dan, uh, 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 TK uh, was on and I was wondering if he could give us an update on the uh, Winlink uh, project that FARS has installed. <laughs> 